I want to get right into the Word. Open your Bibles to the 14th chapter of Matthew, if you will, please. 14th chapter of Matthew. And while we're turning there, or while you're turning there, I'm already there. I want to share with you a portion of the prophetic word the Lord gave me for 2015. How many of you have been watching Brother Copeland's broadcast the last couple of weeks? Boy, I'm telling you, we got into some some deep things and talking about the glory of God, signs and wonders and miracles. Before Evelyn Roberts went home to be with the Lord, and then, of course, Brother Roberts later, they were in our home and spent a couple of days with us. And um, I asked Brother Roberts, sitting at the table, I said, Brother Roberts, what's the last thing the Lord has shown you? What's the last visitation? What was it about? And he said this, he said, the Lord said to me, Oral, if you think you saw miracles and healings under the big tent, you haven't seen anything yet. They're coming back big time. Amen. Everybody say big time. big time. Boy, that blessed me, praise God, because I, um, I didn't grow up in Oral Roberts tent meetings. My wife did. My wife, Carolyn, uh, her mom and dad took her to Oral Roberts tent meetings when she was just a baby, put her on a, on a quilt on the sawdust floor. She was in his meetings. She was in A.A. A. Allen meetings. She was in Jack Cole meetings. She was in William Brennan meetings. In fact, her pastor, Jack Moore, in Shreveport, Louisiana, Life Tabernacle, was best friends with William Brennan. And Carolyn's great uncle, or her, her uncle, uh, a man by the name of Young Brown. If you see a picture of William Brennan, usually you'll see alongside him Gordon Lindsay, Jack Moore, and this tall Native American man by the name of Young Brown. That was Carolyn's uncle. It traveled with William Brennan. So she grew up seeing signs and wonders and miracles from a little girl. I didn't grow up in those kind of circles. And um, when I finally surrendered my life to the Lord in 1969, a few years later, I had the privilege of meeting Oral Roberts and uh, became friends and co-laborers in the Lord. I served on his board for over 25 years and we traveled together, not only here in America from time to time, but other nations as well. And um, the first time I met him, I said, Brother Roberts, I feel like I've been robbed. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I didn't grow up in your meetings. I didn't get to see those signs and wonders and miracles like my wife did. He said, well, you know, we have all that on film and uh, it's down in the archives. And anytime you want to go down there and watch them, I'll, I'll assign an ORU student to go down there with you and you can just watch them as long as you want to. I said, when? He said, whenever you want to. I said, how about right now? He said, okay. So they took me down to the archives and they got out those 16 millimeter film of those crusades and turned them on. And I'm telling you, I sat there and cried like a baby watching the anointing of God. Just so amazing. And, I, I, and when that one was over, I said, show another one. And they showed another one. These were back in the 50s, you know. And uh, when he got through with that, and I said, show me another one. Finally, after several hours, Brother Roberts came back down. He said, you still here? I said, yes, sir. I said, uh, can I do this again tomorrow? He said, yes, if you'd like. So I went in there and stayed all day the next day, just watching all that. He came down and he said, I've never seen anybody so hungry for this. I said, you're looking at one hungry man. I am hungry for the glory of God. I'm hungry for the power of God, for the anointing of God. Amen. He said, well, I'll tell you what, since you enjoy this so much, I'll just have them run them off on VHS back then and you can take them home and watch them. And uh, so I did, man, I took those home and I used to even take them on the road with me when I would travel somewhere. And uh, I'd set up in the room and I'd watch those videos of those crusades. And sometimes it just gets so strong. I'd open the hotel door and take off running around the swimming pool, shouting, <laughs> screaming, rejoicing, come back in and get me another dose and take off running again. You know, people thought I'd lost my mind. And, uh, but that's okay, praise God. I'm telling you, the anointing was so amazing. And you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, that time has come and gone and you know, we'll never see that again. Oh yes, we will. 
In fact, we're already seeing it again, praise God. Amen. We may not be in the full thrust of it, but we are in the room and we are headed for the greater glory beyond anything we've ever experienced before. And I believe beyond anything any other generation has ever experienced before. Amen. I plan to be right in the middle of it. How about you? Amen. So coming into 2015, the Lord said this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'm just going to read the first part of it. He said, experiencing the greater glory is still my plan. And you'll see the great I am will visit your land. Manifestations of my spirit as never before and demonstrations of my power from shore to shore. Supernatural provision and breakthroughs too. Yes, this is my plan and my will for you. Now there's much more to that. But then he said at the end, 2015 will be known as the year of visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. And you know, the Lord gave me this October the 18th, 2014, as we were coming into 2015. And I'm telling you, from the moment I received that from the Lord, I have been seeing that happen. In fact, everywhere I've been, uh, every meeting could turn into an extended meeting. I was in uh, Canada not too long ago and was there for just, supposed to be there for just three nights. And I'm telling you, the people didn't want it to end. They didn't want, they didn't want the meetings to end. They didn't want to go home at night. I mean, God was showing up, doing marvelous things. I was in Florida just a few days ago, three nights, four nights in a meeting, and the people started praying my flights would be canceled. <laughs> they didn't want the meeting to end, you know. It almost worked. We had ice in Dallas, Fort Worth, and I couldn't get there. So I just flew to California, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> I was scheduled to be in California in a couple of days anyway, so it just went early. But I'm telling you, God is doing some exciting things. Amen. Brother Copeland and I were in a meeting together here not too long ago, and, and he started flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, and I'm flowing in the gifts of the Spirit right along with him. And we got back to our room afterwards, and he said, man, this is like it was when we first started out. He said, I hadn't sensed this kind of anointing in a long time. He said, it's back big time. Hallelujah. Amen. Folks, we are headed for the supernatural like no other generation has ever experienced. Praise God. You know, Brother Hagin wrote a book entitled tongues beyond the upper room. If you haven't read it, get it. If you haven't read it in a while, read it again. There's a chapter in there right at the end of the book where he says that the Lord said to him that there is going to be a, a new wave of his glory manifested in the earth. And then he said this, and I will visit every hungry heart. I will visit every hungry heart. Sounds like to me that's probably the prerequisite is a hungry heart. I'm a student of revival. I'm a student of awakenings, outpourings, whatever you want to call them. I've studied them for years and years. I still study them. And every one of them that I have studied, there seems to be this, this uh, common thread or this, this uh, common characteristic. And that is, number one, they hungered for it. People hungered for it. Anybody hungry in here tonight? They hungered for it. Number two, they believed they would see it in their lifetime. How many of you believe you're going to see it in your lifetime? Praise God. Number three, they prayed it in. In fact, in Brother Hagin's book, he said, praying in the spirit is the impetus to it. It, it. it is important that we pray in the spirit if we're going to experience it. You find, you study any of the previous outpourings of God and people prayed them in. Hallelujah. You see, we're not waiting on God. God's waiting on us. Can you say Amen. So I believe we've entered into a new dimension and the glory of God, which is the manifested presence of God, the manifested power of God, and the manifested goodness of God is about to be displayed like we have never experienced before. Anybody ready for it? Praise God. Why don't you give the Lord a shout in advance? Can you do that? Come on, you can shout better than that. Give him a good shout. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to look in Matthew chapter 14. And I want us to begin in verse 13. And I want you to see a pattern here. 
When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and healed their sick. Now, in Luke's account of this, in chapter 9, verse 11, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, He healed them that had need of healing. He healed every person who had need of healing. Now, notice once again, there is a multitude of people that have come out to this place where He is. And He healed all of them that were in need of healing. Verse 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves vigils. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, beside women and children. Now notice, all this took place in the same day. Now, notice it's very clear that there were 5,000 men besides the women and children. So if every man was married, now we've got a crowd of 10,000. If every man and woman had one child, now we've got a crowd of 15,000. More than likely, they had more than one child. Let's say they had two or three. So it's possible that this crowd is close to 35 to 40,000 people. Are you with me? Yes, and notice he healed everybody in that crowd who was in need of healing. How many people do you suppose in a crowd of 40,000 people needed healing? 39,500, you know. Huh? Ask a crowd one night. I was in a, a, in a church where there were over 5,000 people. And I said, how many of you need healing tonight? And it looked like every one of them stood up. You get a, a crowd of people together and the majority of them need healing in some way. So the Bible says, he healed all them that were in need of healing. Now that would have been a good day right there. That would have been a marvelous day. I mean, the disciples could have gone, you know, to bed that night if they could have slept at all after seeing all the healings and miracles, I don't know how they possibly could, you know. But if they were able to go to sleep that night, they went to bed with this on their mind. You know, man, we have seen some things today. But he's not through yet. That evening, after he had healed everybody in that crowd who had need of healing, then he performed supernatural provision. Notice how signs, wonders, and miracles are not limited to physical healings. And many times in our minds, we think that way. When we think about signs, wonders, and miracles, we're thinking about cripples walking. We're thinking about blind seeing, or, or the deaf hearing, or the, uh, the, the, the uh, person that's lame, leaping and walking and praising God. And that's all part of it. But signs, wonders, and miracles are not to be limited to physical healings because supernatural provision is very much a part of that. And that's what I want to deal with tonight. I want to talk to you about supernatural provision. The prophetic word the Lord gave me was that he would not only visit the land, that we would see his power and demonstration beyond anything we've ever seen before, but there would be supernatural provision and breakthroughs too. How many of you could use some supernatural provision? Anybody need a breakthrough? Praise God. Well, I challenge you to mix your faith with what you are about to hear because if you don't mix faith with it, then it won't profit you, the Bible says. 
So set your faith right now that you're going to believe God throughout the course of this year and hereafter, but especially beginning this year for supernatural provision and breakthroughs beyond anything you've ever experienced before. Will anybody set their selves in agreement with me? Praise God. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm setting my faith right now for supernatural provision and breakthroughs beginning this year beyond anything I've ever experienced before. Give the Lord a shout in advance. Amen. Hallelujah. So notice how they go together. In the mind of Jesus, you heal the sick and you provide whatever else people might need, even if it has to be done supernaturally. Now, I like to think of supernatural provision is God doing it in ways that you couldn't dream up in a thousand years. Amen? See, if you can dream it up, then it might not be supernatural. I mean, in ways you couldn't dream up in a thousand years. Like uh, when Carol and I first started in the ministry back there in 1969. And... Uh, we, we had an old car that was absolutely worn out. Had over, I don't know, nearly 150,000 miles on it. Engine shot, transmission shot, everything was shot. In fact, I found out what kind of faith man Kenneth Copeland was the first time he got in that car. <laughs> he called me one day and said, I need you to take me to the airport. Well, my car didn't, didn't, it didn't respond to putting a key into an ignition and then it just started. You prayed in tongues at least 15 minutes before you ever turned the ignition on. It only responded to tongues. Anybody ever had an old car like that? You know? And uh, Brother Copeland wanted me to come take him to the airport. So I got out there early because Brother Copeland don't like being late. So I got out there extra early, made sure this thing's going to start. And it's a cold winter day in Fort Worth. And, and I drive over to Brother Copeland's house and go inside and get his luggage and put it in my car. I left the car running, you know. <laughs> Didn't want to take a chance the thing might not start again. So I left it running and got him in the car and we're driving to the airport. And it's so cold. Brother Copeland said, Jerry, turn the heater up. I said, don't be moved by what you feel. It's on high right now. <laughs> he said, the heater's on. I said, on high, look right here, high. He said, it's not doing anything. I said, I told you, don't be moved by what you feel. <laughs> you don't want to talk me that. <laughs> it's so cold, you can see our breath as we're talking to each other, you know. And so we drive a little further and Brother Copeland is sitting over there shivering, man. And finally, he said out loud, I mean in a loud voice, in the name of Jesus, I command this heater to work. And boy, that thing came on. It got so hot in there, I had to turn it off. I mean, it'd like to run us out of there. I said, Brother Copeland, don't ease up on your faith now because we are approaching an intersection. I'm about to turn left. The transmission slips sometime and traffic's coming your way. You better keep your faith on the line. So he continued to pray in tongues, you know. <laughs> so I found out what kind of faith man he was in my car. Well, I get invited to come to Oklahoma City to do a, a youth meeting. And I'm in that old car. And um, I, got, I got my daughters with me. They're just little girls. They're, they're probably, uh, well, Jerry Ann was born in 68, Terry in 69. This is 1971. So they're, they're just a couple of years old, two, three years year old. And we're headed to Oklahoma City in this old car. The tires are so bad, you can see the air in them especially the two on the front. And I don't have money for new tires. I don't have money for used tires. I don't have money for retreads. Some of you don't even know what retread is. And, and I'm believing God this thing's going to get us to Oklahoma City and get us back. I had just enough money to get up there, feed my family, put some gas in the car, and hope to God they're going to Give me an offering before I head back. Because if they don't, we're going we to hitchhike or something, you know. And so uh, we're headed up there. And my girl said, Daddy, we're hungry. 
Well, there's a little Dairy Queen looking place up here on the, on the highway off to the right. So I stopped in there and I bought a, a hamburger and fries and two Cokes and we split it between the four of us. And then we started to get back up on Interstate 35 going north to Oklahoma City. Well, I looked back to make sure there's no traffic coming because once again, I told you this transmission slips. <laughs> it don't always engage when you accelerate. And so I made sure I looked all the way back to Dallas and nothing was coming. <laughs> you know? And then uh, I, I was just about to get on the, on the interstate and I looked again and, and there was a truck coming. I guess I didn't see it. And so I had to wait for that truck. Well, it went past us. This truck must have been doing 75 and we're on the access road waiting to get up. And it was a Firestone tire company truck loaded with brand new tires. And so it flies by us. I look back, make sure nothing's coming and I get on the highway and we're heading toward Oklahoma. Oklahoma City. And uh, I had met a, a man before this uh, out in California, and he gave, how many remember, eight tracks? And he gave me one of his eight tracks, one of his first eight tracks. And I put it in my car, and Carolyn and myself and the girls were all singing along with him. And it was Andre Crouch. And he was singing, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all. And so we're all singing, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. And we're all singing, and all of a sudden I said, Carolyn, what is that coming down the road? She said, I don't know. I said, it's coming toward us in our lane. She said, I don't know. I said, it looks like two tires. She said, it is two tires. Two tires were rolling down the road in our lane together and about a hundred yards before we got to them, they rolled off in the ditch on the side of the road. Well, I knew they fell off that truck. So I pulled off and I got them and put them in the trunk of my car and I drove to Oklahoma City. As soon as I got there, I called every Firestone dealership in Oklahoma City to see uh, which one of their stores had two tires fall off the truck. And every one of them I talked to, they said, son, uh, nobody's reported any tires missing. I said, I know they fell off your truck because I saw the truck go by me earlier today and I know they fell off that truck. And I called every one of them. They, none of them reported any tires missing. Finally, the last guy said, listen, I don't know where they, uh, what, what, anything about them. Nobody's reported any tires missing. We've got all our inventory. So as far as I'm concerned, they're yours. I said, okay. So I went back and I looked in the trunk and wouldn't you know it, they were exactly my size. <laughs> Amen. Exactly my size. Now, do you think for one moment I could have dreamed up that scenario? <laughs> now, God, I got to have two tires. Oh God, I need two tires. Oh Jesus, we need two tires. Lord, how are you going to do it? I know have two tires fall off a truck, roll down the highway. I couldn't dream that up, but God dreamed it up. Why? He has no limitations. Somebody said, well, how do you think he did it? I never asked. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, an angel came down and just thumped two off, praise God, and then replaced them before they got back to the shop, and I wound up with my two tires. Hallelujah. Now, I call that supernatural provision. So I said, I don't believe that. Well, if you don't believe that one, you're going to struggle with this one. <laughs> you're going to struggle with this one big time. <laughs> Another time, by this time, I've got a better car now. This is 1973, and God's blessed me with a 1969 Pontiac Bonneville. It wasn't a new car, but it was far better. It was like a new car, low mileage, I mean, brand, almost like a brand new car. And, and once again, I'm going to Oklahoma City, but this time I'm going to preach my grandfather's funeral. And so we go up to Oklahoma City. We're driving along there. Man, it's nice driving a nice car, you know, not have to be concerned about the transmission, whether it's going to start or not, the tires, man. You know, as we say back where I come from, we in high cotton now, man. And so we're driving along there, you know, and, and um, get to Oklahoma City, do the funeral, 
Well, the relatives hadn't seen me in a long time. They're begging us to stay. I needed to be back in Fort Worth the next day. So we stayed as late as we could. And then uh, we got in the car. I filled the car up with gas and we started down I-35 South, head back to Fort Worth. Now, by this time, it's one o'clock in the morning and we're driving to Fort Worth. My daughters are asleep in the back seat. Carolyn's asleep. Uh, she brought a pillow with her. She had leaned up there and, and she's asleep. Now I'm driving along here in the boondocks out there on I-35. I don't even have a clue where I'm at right now. And I'm just driving along there, you know, and all of a sudden I heard a loud noise under my car and I ran over something in the road and I didn't see it. I didn't know what it was, but it was so loud, it hit the bottom of the car and it woke Carolyn up. She said, what is that? I said, I don't know. I ran over something. It's okay, just going back to sleep. And so I'm driving along there and I just happened to look down at my fuel gauge and it's doing this. And then I smell fuel. Whatever I hit, a pipe or something in the road, it knocked a gash in my fuel tank. So I stopped the car and got over on the side of the road and looked underneath and gas is pouring out of my fuel tank. Now here it is, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, out on I-35. I don't remember how far back the last town is. I don't know how far it is to the next town. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I mean, I sit there and watch all the fuel drain out of my car. Well, I, I don't want to take off walking because I don't want to leave my family out there on the highway by themselves late at night like that. And so, you know, what am I going to do? So Carol and I just joined hands. We said, God, we need help. You're El Shaddai. You're the God in whom nothing is impossible. Send us help. And so we sat there in the car and I'm looking in my rear view mirror to see when some headlights might show up. It was quite a while. There was no traffic out on the highway that night. Finally, I saw some headlights and I got out of the car, got my flashlight and I stood in front of my car. I didn't want to get out there in the highway and maybe the guy not see me and run over me. So I'm, I'm standing out there with my flashlight like this and this pickup truck pulls in behind me. A guy gets out of the truck. He says, um, what do you need? I told him what had happened. And I said, can you help me? He said, that's what I'm here for. I said, great. I'm glad you're here for this. <laughs> he went to the back of his truck, got a chain, hooked it to his rear bumper, hooked it to mine front. And he told me about 15 miles. We got off the interstate, went across the interstate and over on the left was a little service station. It looked like it had been built in the forties and there was a little cafe next door to it. And that's it. Now, I'm sure there was a town a little further down, but right there off the interstate, that's it. This little gas station and this little cafe. And so we pull up in there. He reaches in his pocket, gets out a set of keys and unlocks the door to this service station. And then he flips the light on. And then he goes into the garage area. He opens the overhead door, flips the light on. We push my car inside the little station. He puts it up on the rack and then he repairs my fuel tank. We push it out to the pumps. He filled my car with gas and he wouldn't take a dime. I said, sir, you don't understand. You were a major blessing to us tonight. I don't know what we'd have done without you. And he said again, the only thing he ever said uh, the whole time I was with him, he said again, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. I said, sir, please let me pay you. No, that's what I'm here for. And he would not take any money. So we drove home. And of course, you know, we're rejoicing all the way. I mean, God just did a major miracle for us. Well, we get home and about, I don't know, four or five months later, I'm asked to come back to Oklahoma City to do a meeting. And I'm thinking on the way up there, I'm going to stop at that little station and thank that man again and see if he won't let me buy him lunch or something, you know. So I'm watching for that little station. I saw it. I pulled off the highway. There's the little station, the little cafe next door. I pull up in front of that station. It's locked up. It doesn't look like it's been open at all since the last time I was there. So I went next door to the cafe. I said, sir, do you know the man that owns this service station? He said, son, that service station has been closed for years. I said, no, about four months ago, six months ago, uh, there was a man pulled my car up here, turned the light on, repaired my, my, my fuel tank, and filled my car up with gas. He said, not at this station. I said, yes, sir, right here. Yeah, I remember your little cafe. I saw the name, and you're the one. It's right next door. 
He said, no, that's not possible. I said, yes, sir. The man flipped the light on, repaired my gas tank, and filled my car up with gas. He said, son, that station's been closed for years. There's no electricity there. There's no, there's no gas in those tanks, not in the pumps, nor the tanks underneath. It, that's impossible. I said, no, sir, this is where it happened. And he would not believe me that that happened there, but I knew that's where it happened. And so I finally got my car, got on the highway and started toward Oklahoma City. I said, Lord, I know that's the place. He said it was. I said, then why don't that man uh, understand that this happened there? He said, because he can understand. I said, why not? He said, didn't I tell you there will be times when you might entertain angels? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you entertained an angel. Don't you remember what he kept saying to you? That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. Hebrews says, they're all ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto those who are heirs of salvation. I found out angels can drive pickups. I found out angels have t uh, chains in the back of them pickups. I found out angels have keys to buildings that don't have keys. I found out angels can turn on lights when there's no electricity. I found out angels can get gas out of tanks that are empty. Hallelujah. I don't believe that. Well, you're going to really struggle with this one. <laughs> <laughs> one time Peter needed tax money. I said, one time Peter needed tax money. And Jesus said, go fishing. And the first fish you catch, take the money out of his mouth, pay your taxes and mine. Now Peter, before joining Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association, had been a professional fisherman. He, James, John, Mr. Zebedee were all in the fishing business. And you know, if that had ever happened to Peter before, he would have immediately said, oh yeah, yeah. I remember a time when that happened once before when I got money out of a fish. Never happened to him. Never happened to him. And do you think he could have dreamed up that scenario? No, if he had, he wouldn't ask Jesus about what to do. And he went fishing, and the first fish he caught, he took the money out of his mouth and did what Jesus told him to do with it. That's supernatural provision. You see, that's provision that you couldn't dream up, that you couldn't make happen, that you couldn't, you couldn't possibly uh, dream it up on your own. And listen, the God who did that is the God who wants to continue doing that if his people will just trust him. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Now, uh, a preacher friend of mine, I won't call his name, but uh, I met him a number of years ago down in South Louisiana. <clears throat> and um, he was not brought up in the word of faith. In fact, the circles he was in, they, they kind of talked ugly about us who preach faith. But somehow he and I wound up being speakers in this conference down in South Louisiana. And... Uh, he heard me preach that night, came up to me afterward. He said, he said, I've never heard anything like this. He said, I've been wrong about you guys. He said, if this is the word of faith, I want it. He said, would you teach me? I said, well, yeah, I'd be happy to. He said, can I come visit you sometime and just sit down with you, spend the day with you, and you teach me the word of faith? He said, man, this is what I need to get a hold of. He said, I've never heard anything like this. This is not what they told me you guys preach." And so he came, brought his wife. Carol and I just fell in love with him. And so we invited him to stay in our ministry apartment for a few days and had him over to our home for lunch. And we'd go out for dinner and then we'd stay up till one and two o'clock in the morning every night, just feeding them the word of faith. And they were like little babies. I mean, they were like little birds just taking it in. And they were getting more and more excited about it. And he'd say, now, Brother Jerry, how did, you, how did you acquire all this? Your, your ministry, your, you, know, you don't have any debt. Uh, how did you do that? Uh, how did you get your airplane? How did you get your buildings? How do you do that? We don't know how to do that. So I taught him on the law of seed time and harvest. I said, everything you see came from sowing seed. 
Everything has a testimony. Everything is a harvest from seeds we sowed. We sowed when we didn't have anything. We sowed our way out of debt. We sowed our way out of lack. We sowed our way out of want. And everything we have is paid for and has a testimony to it, praise God. And so I'm teaching him the law of seed time and harvest. He said, but how does God bring the harvest to you? I said, that part, I never know. I never know how God's going to do it. And really, that's not my job to figure out how God's going to do it. My job is to believe he can and believe he will. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. That's all I'm required to do. Believe he can and believe he will. He said, but I just don't understand how you can just trust him like that. And, and I said, well, when you've done it as long as I have, then praise God, it just becomes first nature to you. You just dare believe. I said, you know, I don't care if God has to use an old dog with a bag full of money to meet my needs. If that's how God wants to do it, then fine with me. I said, I have a pond right out here by my house. It don't make me any difference if God sends me out there and tells me the first fish I catch out of my pond, take the money out. He said, you really believe that? I said, well, why not? It happened to Peter. He said, you're a nut. I said, I may be, but I'm a nut with my needs met. You're the nut that don't know how. Amen. Amen. He said, you really believe this? I said, I'm telling you, this is the way we've lived. I'm, I'm not telling you I've got money out of a fish's mouth. I'm not telling you an old dog has brought a bag full of money. But my attitude is, I don't care how God does it. My job is just to believe he can, believe he will, and let God figure it out. In fact, a lot of times when I go to bed at night, last thing I'll say, God, your word says you neither, you neither sleep nor slumber. I'm human. I need sleep. I'm going to bed. Since you're going to be up all night, figure it all out and tell me about it in the morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this preacher friend of mine, he left my house and went to Alabama to preach a meeting. And when he got there, the pastor said, uh, you don't have anything to do today. We don't start preaching until tomorrow. He said, man, I'm a fisherman. I love fishing. He said, you want to go fishing with me? He said, well, I've never fished much. You'll have to show me what to do. I don't know much about fishing. He said, that's fine. Just come out and get in the boat with me. We'll sit out there in fellowship and, and I'll show you how to fish. So they're out there in this lake and this got, it's full of big mouth bass, you know. And so this preacher friend of mine that had spent this time with me, he cast his rod out there and a little while, man, this bass hit that thing. He reeled it in. He got it in the boat and he picked it up and he said, pastor, what is this? What is this in this fish's mouth? He said, what? He said, look, something yellow wrapped around its lip. He said, oh, my Lord, you caught the prize. He said, what do you mean? <clears throat> he said, they came out here, <clears throat> excuse me, they came out here and they took se several of these bass and they put a yellow band in their mouth and anybody that catches one wins $1,000. <laughs> he said, you just won $1,000. He got on his cell phone and told me, he said, Brother Jerry, you're not going to believe this. I said, I'm the believer. You're the non-believer. What? <laughs> he said, I just caught a fish that's worth $1,000. I said, I'll expect the tithe in the mail, right? <laughs> now, that, he couldn't dream up that scenario. But God did. And I think God did it just for him to inspire his faith. In fact, he wasn't... It wasn't too long after that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about days or weeks, but it, it, it was less than two years after that. That guy learned how to believe God financially. And one day he comes to my office and he says, this is for teaching me the word of faith and handing me a check for $100,000. So it was working for him. Hallelujah. He learned how to tap into supernatural provision. Can you say amen? amen. Look at your neighbor and say, and God's no respecter of persons. Tell the person on the other side, I'm probably next. <clears throat> Can you say amen? amen? All right, now, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Let's, let's look a little deeper in the word about supernatural provision. Hallelujah. 
You all know the story here. God says to Abraham when he's 99 years old that I'll make my covenant between me and thee. I'll multiply thee exceedingly. He'd already told him in Genesis chapter 12 that he would bless him. And the Amplified says not only bless him, but give him an abundant increase of favors. And no, you know the story of how, you know, God said they would have a child and from this child would come a mighty nation. And of course, Sarah can't figure out how this could possibly be. In fact, she laughed when she heard it. God said, why did your wife Sarah laugh? And then he says to her, is anything too hard for the Lord? In the little Hebrew, it's El Shaddai, the God in whom nothing is impossible. Is anything too hard for the God in whom nothing is impossible? And of course, over a period of time, you know, it looks like it's not going to work. So they lean to the arm of the flesh. Don't look so holy. We've all done it. <laughs> you know, God's taken too long. So we make things happen. And so one day, you know, Abraham comes home from whatever it was he was doing. And Sarah says, uh, you know, I've really been praying about this. Seeking the Lord. And, uh, you know, Abraham, there's just no way that I can have a child. You know that, I know that. I don't know why God even said that. But I have figured it out that Hagar, my handmaiden, she can conceive. And perhaps that's the way God wants you to have this child. <clears throat> Did you notice that Abraham didn't say, I rebuke that? <laughs> Devil, get off my wife. He said, that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> and an Ishmael was born. Amen? An Ishmael. Paul picks up on this in Galatians and he says, Ishmael was of the flesh. So now we're talking about people who have decided that God's taking too long. We can't figure out how he's going to do it. So we're going to make it happen ourselves. And we're also talking about the father of faith. <laughs> Except when this all happened, he's not the same man that we read about in Genesis 17 when he's 99. He's not the same man that we read about in Romans chapter 4 where he staggered not at the promise of God. He uh, was not moved by the deadness of Sarah's womb, neither his own body, now dead, being nearly 100 years old. See, the man Paul's writing about in Romans 4 is not the man that had Ishmael. He is the man, but we're not talking about when he was that age. He didn't become this great faith hero until he was 99. Are you with me? And if you study your Bible very closely, you'll notice that the moment Ishmael was born, God didn't speak to Abraham again for 13 years. And when he talks to him again, it's Genesis 17 where we just read and it's not a casual conversation. It was actually a rebuke. And he says, stand before me and walk upright and be perfect. In other words, he's saying, Abraham, I don't need your help. All I need is your faith. The Bible said he fell on his face. <laughs> and then from that moment, he never looks back. He's not considering Sarah's deadness of her womb, nor his own body. He staggered not at the promise of God. And then Ish, uh, Isaac was born. And Paul picks up on this once again in Galatians and says, Ishmael was of the flesh, but Isaac by the spirit. There are some things that we make happen for ourselves. And then there's things that come by faith. Amen. Supernatural things. Amen. I learned a long time ago, you don't want to fly Ishmael airplanes. You don't want to live in Ishmael houses. That's right. That's good. You don't want to drive Ishmael cars. And you certainly do not want an Ishmael wife or an Ishmael husband. They're hard to get rid of. <laughs> in fact, the problem we're having in the world today is an Ishmael problem. <laughs> Amen. See what Abraham and Sarah did? Wouldn't have all these wars going on. Wasn't for them leaning to the flesh. Okay. So the moment 
that this man settles it in his heart. No more leaning to the arm of the flesh. I will stagger not at the promise of God. I am not going to consider the deadness of her womb, nor the oldness of my body. And he was fully persuaded that God was able to do what he'd promised. And as a result, Isaac was born. Now, a few years later, go to Genesis chapter 22. God now asked Abraham to take this faith son and offer him as a sacrifice in Genesis chapter 22. He says in verse 2, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. Now notice, read this closely. Abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And notice it does not say, And I and I alone will come again. Huh? No, it is implying I and the lad will go yonder and worship and I and the lad will come again. But God's already asked him to offer this boy as a sacrifice. And yet Abraham says, we'll be back. Amen. And you notice also that apparently this is not Isaac's first time to be involved in a sacrifice. He's familiar with this. He's watched his father do this before. Because on the way up that mountain, he says to his father, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where is the lamb? So he knows something about sacrifices. And did you notice it didn't say, and Abraham turned and said, you're it. (laughs) And then you notice the next verse didn't say, and three years later, they caught up with Isaac in Egypt. No. No. Notice what God's, uh, what Abraham said. It was Abraham who established the fact that God will provide. It wasn't God who said that. It was Abraham. And when God's covenant partner, Abraham, decreed God will provide then as a covenant partner, God was obligated from that moment until now and forever to provide when his covenant people are in need. Hallelujah. And notice he said, son, God will provide. Look at verse eight, underline that phrase. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering So they went forth of them together, both of them together. And you know the story. Verse 10, Abraham stretched forth his hand. Notice Isaac got on that altar. Man, you're talking about faith. Isaac got on that altar. He's standing there watching his father raise his knife to slay him. But he's trust in what his father said. God will provide. He doesn't know how. You know, he didn't dream up the ram in the thicket. But God did. And he raised his knife to slay him. And then the angel of the Lord called out and said, Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him and he looked and there was a ram caught in the thicket and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh which means God our provider notice God was already a step ahead of Abraham 
He's already a step ahead when you look to him as the one who provides and is capable of doing it supernaturally if necessary. He's always a step ahead. That ram, God prepared because his covenant man said, God will provide. Hallelujah. And because he did, Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. It marked him. It marked the place. It marked God. That from here on out, when a covenant man, a covenant woman, trusts God to be their provider, then God obligates himself to come through for them as Jehovah Jireh. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Now, what I want you to see is this. Once again, God was already ahead, a step ahead of Abraham. He already had that ram in the thicket. You remember um, the prophet? God told him to go down to the brook Cherith. And he said, I have commanded the ravens to sustain thee. And the prophet went down to the brook. And sure enough, just like God said, the ravens brought him food. Amen. And then when the brook dried up, God said, go to Zarephath and there is a widow woman there that I have commanded to sustain thee. Notice God's already always a step ahead. He had the ram in the thicket. He had the ravens by the brook. He's got the widow woman in Zarephath. He's always a step ahead. He had the fish in the sea waiting on Peter. You're sitting here right now needing supernatural provision in your life, needing breakthroughs in your life, and I just want you to know that God's already a step ahead of you. Hallelujah. Say this with me. God's got my ram in the thicket waiting on me. God's got my ravens by the brook waiting on me. God's got my widow woman in Zarephath waiting on me. God's got my fish in the sea, waiting on me. Amen. I don't know who that widow woman is. I don't know that fish's name and I don't know which raven it is. And many times they're not fish, ravens. They can be in the form of people. Amen. I was um, back in the early 70s I was asked to come and do a, a three-day meeting in Peor, uh, uh, Blooming, Bloomingdale, Illinois. And uh, the full gospel businessmen had asked me to stay over and do their uh, monthly meeting and banquet for them. At this time, there was a young man working for me by the name of Russ Taff. Anybody heard of Russ Taff? This poor Russ went with the Imperials. And he was just a young boy. And... Uh, I'm teaching Russ the life of faith. So we're driving up there. And uh, on the way up, and I turned and told Russ, the Lord said, the entirety of the time that you're in this meeting, do not receive one offering. I said out loud, why would I not want to do that? He said, because I'm going to show you I can meet your needs beyond the normal way receiving an offering. That'd be the normal way. You know, you go do a meeting, receive an offering. He said, don't receive one offering the entire time you're there. I'm doing three services a day for three days in this meeting. And he said, don't receive one offering. I had people come up and said, you hadn't, you hadn't received an offering. I said, no. Well, why not? I said, the Lord told me not to. Wow, never heard of that. Never heard of a preacher not receiving an offering. People tried to tried to make me take an offering. I said, no, the Lord told me not to. Now, Russ is just learning. And he's, I know what he's wondering. I perceived his thoughts. How am I going to get paid? You know? I said, Russ, you just watch. God is going to show us supernatural provision. And so we got through with that meeting and the full gospel businessmen said, uh, all right, you're coming over tomorrow night to do our banquet. And the president said, now, Brother Jerry, we don't have a very large chapter here. And said, uh, we normally don't have over 20 people show up for our banquet. Not only that, our chapter's in the red. We don't have any money 
to give you a dime. I said, that's fine. I didn't come for your money. I said, in fact, the Lord told me not to receive any offerings while I'm here. I said, so I don't want an offering. And then the Lord said, and tell him you're going to pay for the banquet. I said, and why would I want to do that? He said, because I'm going to show you I can meet your needs beyond the normal ways. I said, and by the way, I'm going to go ahead and pay for the banquet too. So whatever the cost of the banquet is, I'm going to pay for that. He said, really? I said, yes, sir. I'm going to pay for the banquet. He said, there's only 20 people show up, you know, you know, seven, 10, $12 a head, whatever. So I'm going to pay for the banquet too. Get over there that night and there's 200 people show up. <laughs> that little room, I couldn't even move. People were sitting, at, I couldn't move. It was so thick with people. 200 of them, I'm paying for it all. <laughs> Russ's eyes got this big. I know what he's thinking. How am I going to get paid this month and next month? And <clears throat> I said, Russ, you just watch. God's, God's working on something. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know my God will provide. So we finished that meeting, paid for their banquet. I even gave the full gospel businessmen an offering to get them in the black. Hallelujah. They weren't the $5 in the black, but they weren't in the red anymore, <laughs> you know. And we got in our van and we headed back to Fort Worth. And coming down through there, uh, in Texacana, at the state line, there's an El Chico restaurant, if you're coming from the north, over on the left-hand side. And Carol and I used to eat there all the time. So I said, Russ, let's go to El Chico's and get some Mexican food. So we pulled in there. And it was later than noon. It was early afternoon. So there was only, you know, two or three people in there. So they seated us and I'm looking at the menu and he's looking at the menu and we order. And in a little while, this elderly couple, I saw them sitting over to the side. They came over to me and said, are you Jerry Seville? I said, yes, I am. They said, well, we don't know if you remember us or not, but you came to uh, Benton, Arkansas a couple of years ago. And the church you were supposed to preach in wouldn't let you in because you weren't ordained with their denomination. I said, oh, I remember that well. <laughs> and said, and we wanted you to preach, but we didn't have a building. And so one of our friends offered you their front porch and you preached to us for three days while everybody brought lawn chairs and sat out in the front yard and you preached from the porch. I said, oh yeah, I'll never forget that either. They said, well, we were in that meeting and it changed our life. We never heard preaching like that in our life and said it just absolutely changed our life. And we were sitting over here and, and kept thinking about you. And we said, you know, we just received a, a, a major, uh, uh, they had a, some project. I think he was in construction and he just got uh, paid on a job. And he said, and we were just sitting here thinking, where are we going to send the tithe for this? And your name came up and said, so we just wrote out a check while we're sitting over there for the tithe on this job. And we were going straight from here to the post office, looked up and there you come through the door. He said, son, you just saved me a stamp here. And he handed me that check. And of course, Russ's eyes got to sparkling, you know, and he just acted like, yeah, we do this all the time. Hallelujah. And so I, I prayed with him. I took the check and I put it in my pocket and Russ <laughs> wants to know what it is, you know. And I did that on purpose. Then I took it out and I said, look at this, Russ. It not only covered that entire budget of that meeting, not only covered what I paid for that banquet, but it covered nearly three months of my budget and my ministry, praise God. <laughs> Amen. Now, do you think I could dream that up? If I, if I could dream that up, I would go to El Chico's in Texarkana every time I have a need. <laughs> in fact, I can almost hear somebody thinking out loud, I'm going there tomorrow. <laughs> I think those people have already passed away. See, that was God, supernatural. Those people became my ram in the thicket. They were my ravens at the brook. They were my widow woman in Zarephath. They were my fish in the sea. And God's got them ready for you, praise God. I don't care what your need is, how impossible it may seem. 
I'm telling you, we've entered into a time where supernatural provision and breakthroughs are not going to be the rare. They're going to become the norm. Hallelujah. You're going to see God do things you have not likely seen him do quite that way before from here on out. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. I was in uh, Toronto a few years ago and I was, I was building a medical facility in, a, in an African nation. And uh, I'd believe God to pay for this thing as I went, pay cash as I went. And if you think building a medical facility in a third world country is cheap, you've never built one. And, and I'm, I'm sunk a lot of money into this. I'm building this, this facility in an area where there are 2 million people that don't have medical facilities. And uh, so I think I've got it all done and ready and I'm going over to dedicate it. And my directors call me and say, no, it's not quite ready. They, last time they did that, I needed another 30,000. God brought it in. Uh, this time they said, we need another 20,000. Well, I didn't have another 20,000 for that project. I had money in the bank, but it was designated for other projects in other nations. And I couldn't use it because that's what the IRS calls misappropriating funds. When you've, when you've generated funds for a certain project and you use it somewhere else, that's misappropriating funds. So I didn't have an extra $20,000 for this project. I already sunk hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into this. And so I'm going to Toronto. So on the way up there, I just said, Lord, I just want to thank you for that extra $20,000. And Lord, you know I'm scheduled to go dedicate this place in a, in, a, in, a, in a short time. So I'd appreciate it if you'd do a suddenly. We need a suddenly here uh, with that extra $20,000. And so I got to Toronto. They picked me up the airport, took me to my hotel, had just enough time to change my clothes, get in my suit, went to the church. And when I walked up the steps to this church, to the front door, there was a couple standing there. And they said, Brother Jerry, you remember the last time you were here? I said, oh yeah. I said, you remember that meeting? Uh, you came for one night and stayed 21 nights? I said, oh yeah, that was, a, that was a special meeting. They said, well, God did so many wonderful things for us in that meeting and, and we just wanted to be a blessing to your ministry. So that's the reason we're standing here. We, we have something we want to sow into your ministry. And he handed me an envelope. And so I prayed with him. Pastor said, Brother Jerry, it's time to come in. And, and I prayed with him. They left. I put the envelope in my inside suit pocket here. Went on in there, preached that night, got back to my hotel, took my suit off, hung it up, went to bed, got up the next morning, put on another suit, went to the morning service. And uh, on the way over there, I said, Lord, I just want to thank you for that $20,000. Thank you, Lord, for the $20,000. I'm not asking him again, because I believe I received when I prayed. Now I'm just thanking him. And I said, thank you for that $20,000. Preached that morning, go to lunch with the pastor, come back to the hotel, put my suit away, and then that night I put on another suit and I go to the meeting. And I'm thanking the Lord on the way over there. Thank you, Lord, for that $20,000. I did that for three days. And finally, the last day I was there, I got up that morning. I said, Lord, I just want to thank you for the $20,000. He said, would you please go look in your suit? <laughs> I said, what? He said, the first night those people gave you something, you put it in your suit and you've never looked at it. I forgot about it. I walked in there and pulled that envelope out and there was a check for $20,000. Those people were my ram in the thicket. They were my ravens by the brook. They were my widow woman in Zarephath. They were my fish in the sea. Hallelujah. What do you suppose God's working on while you're sitting here listening to me right now? For this is the time for supernatural provision and breakthroughs beyond anything we've ever seen before. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. Get him out of your little box. Just because he did it one way one time doesn't mean he might do it the same way the next time. Amen? I got to tell you this. I, told, I probably told you before, but it's my sermon. I can tell you again if I want to. But this is my favorite one with supernatural provision. I know I've probably shared it here before, but it's, it just is just so faith inspiring. 
When I, when I first went in the ministry in 1969, the Lord said to me that I would not be able to fulfill what I'm called to do without airplanes in my ministry. And then he said this. Now you have to understand, 1969, I'm believing God to pay my old business debts off. I shut down my automotive business. I still got debts I'm believing to pay off. I got debts personally I'm believing to pay off. You know, I got, a, I got stuff going on financially. I wish I could have gone into the ministry and I was already debt free, but no, you know. <laughs> I got all this baggage I'm carrying around with me, believe in God, you know. And so uh, he said, I, you won't be able to fulfill what you're called to do without airplanes. And then he said this, and I don't want you ever flying airplanes with debt on them. You believe me for them debt free. Well, he just, he just told me, <laughs> impossible. My car wasn't even debt free. He's talking airplanes. I, I, I think I'm still got notes on the washer and dryer. Probably the broom too. You know, that's the only way I knew how to live back then is debt. I borrowed for everything. And uh, he's talking debt-free airplanes. Well, obviously, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take me doing some, some uh, tremendous time in the Word to build my faith up to that level. Well, then I get invited to come to Fort Worth and go to work with Brother Copeland. And I start flying with him from time to time. I was with him when he got his first debt-free airplane. It wasn't much faster than a lawnmower with wings, but it was paid for. <laughs> Amen. I was with him when he got his second debt-free airplane, a little Cessna 310. I was with him when he got his third debt-free airplane, a little Cessna 414. So I watched somebody that knew how to do this. And that was inspiring to my faith. And so, uh, you know, after I left Brother Copeland's organization, launched out in this ministry, uh, you know, I didn't need the airplane right then, but it wasn't long, man, the demand on my ministry, I mean, it just like it just increased almost overnight. And now I can't get to all the places I'm invited to driving. I, I need an airplane. And so I've been believing God for this. And, and nobody knew anything about it but me and Carolyn and my two girls and the two people that worked for me at the time and Kenneth and Gloria Copeland because they were the only people I knew back then that knew how to believe for debt-free airplanes. And I took all the seed <clears throat> that I could gather up and I sowed it into his aviation department, believing God for my first airplane. I didn't know how he was going to do it. I couldn't dream it up. So I get invited to come preach in Andrews, Texas, out West Texas, a little small town. At one time back many years ago, it was one of those oil boom towns. A lot of old money there back in the day, you know, from oil. Now it's, now it's almost an, an abandoned looking place. And uh, so I get invited to come preach there and the same thing happened there to me that happened in Arkansas. When the pastor found out I wasn't ordained with his organization, he wouldn't let me hold a meeting in his church. So a couple there said, if you'll stay, we'll find a place. The only place they could find in Andrews, Texas, for me to preach in was an abandoned laundromat <laughs> on Main Street. A laundromat. We went down there and looked at this place. There's broken down washers and dryers in the place. It's filthy, nasty. And, and he said, this is all we can find. I said, well, how am I going to preach in this place? He said, we'll just move everything up against the wall and we'll take one of the dryers and make that your pulpit. <laughs> I said, well, what are people going to sit in? He said, I'll go see if we can borrow some folding chairs. He could not find one place in Andrews that would loan him any chairs. He said, that's not going to stop us. I have a friend who has a salvage yard and let's go out there. And we took seats out of wrecked cars <laughs> and put them in the laundromat. Now, please get a picture of this. <laughs> Does this look like a place for the miraculous? <laughs> Does this look like a place where we're about to have a major breakthrough? I'm talking about a laundromat. Behind me is all these old washers and dryers. I got one I'm preaching from. 
and people are sitting on seats out of wrecked cars. Now, I'm there, my wife's there, my two daughters are there, and the two people who work for me at that time are there, and the couple who invited me. So that means uh, four of us, six of us, there's eight people there and six of them belong to me. The offerings were terrible. My family didn't even give. And I have committed to do this for three days, three services a day. The next morning, we got the same bunch, but somebody else showed up. That afternoon, we had three or four more show up. That night, three or four more that showed up didn't come back. I mean, I'm preaching my little heart out. I'm preaching faith. I'm preaching everything Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, or Robertson T.L. Osborne knew in one sermon. I'm preaching everything I know, you know. But the last day, the last day of this meeting, I'm standing there behind this old driver. And of course, this, we're on Main Street, so I can see the traffic out there. The people are looking at me like you're looking at me, but I can see outside. Every once in a while, somebody would come up to the window and put their head up there. And, and I'd go, hey. <laughs> But this old pickup truck pulled up in front of the laundromat. And the man in it was so large, he looked like he took up half the cab. Had on bib overalls and a straw hat. And he got out of that truck and he came in the laundromat. Now nobody sees him yet, only I can see him. And he walks in that laundromat, takes that straw hat off. And I thought he just found out about the meeting, he's gonna take a seat or two or three. And, uh, <laughs> but he doesn't stop. He walks in there and he just keeps walking toward me. And he walks up to me. Now folks, this boy's country. I'm talking really country. I'm gonna do my best to sound like him and it's not even close. You understand? This boy is so far back in the woods, he has to go toward town to hunt. <laughs> That's country. <laughs> He's so far back in the woods, June bugs don't show up till August. <laughs> Now we're talking, we're talking a good 300 pounds. And he's standing there in front of me. I mean, he just interrupted the whole service. Standing there in front of me, took that straw hat off, got them bib overalls, dust flying everywhere. He said, my name is Oop. I said, pardon me? He said, I said, my name is Oop. I said, Oop? I thought, what in the world was his mama thinking when she named him? I said, your name is Oop? He said, my name is Oop. I said, okay, Mr. Oop, would you like to take a seat? No, I don't. I said, well, Mr. Oop, I'm having a meeting here. I know it. I got something God wants me to do. When I'm done, I'll leave, and you'll never see me again unless God tells me. He said, I don't do nothing unless God tells me. He said, I quit school at third grade. I can't read nor write. I depend on God for everything. God tells me when to get up. God tells me when to go to bed. God tells me when to do this and where to go. And I'm out riding my tractor, minding my own business, riding my tractor. And God said, there's a young preacher boy down in Andrews at the laundromat needs an airplane. Are you the one? I said, there couldn't be two of us doing this in Andrews. <laughs> there's no way two of us could be doing this. They ain't got but one abandoned laundromat. I said, say that again. He said, I'm out riding my tractor. I said, I got that part. <laughs> he said, I'm out riding my tractor. He said, son, I don't get off my tractor till God tells me to. I wouldn't be right here if God hadn't told me to. When I leave here, you'll never see me again unless God tells me. You got the picture, sonny boy? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, Mr. Hoop, I got the picture. He said, I was out riding my tractor. I said, I got that part. He said, and God told me there's a young preacher boy in Andrews at the laundromat what needs an airplane. Are you the one? 
I said, yes, sir. He said, then good. Here's what God told me to do. And he went to pulling money out of every pocket. I mean, the inside, the outside of them bib overall. He piled it up. It got as high as my shins. He said, that's what God told me to do. Put that hat back on. He said, I'm gone. You'll never see me again unless God tells me. You understand? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Hoop. And he walked out, got in his truck and drove off. All of us are standing there with our mouths open, our eyes this big. I turned to Carolyn. I said, did that really happen? She said, look at your feet. Now, I'd already had this angel with the gas tank business. I thought, that's the fattest angel i ever seen. <laughs> and he wears overalls. But this wasn't an angel, this is a hoop. <laughs> Do you think for one moment, on my best day of trying to help God, I could dream hoop up? <laughs> now, God, I need an airplane. God, I got to have an airplane. How are we going to do this? Oh, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, we got to have an airplane. I got it, Lord. I'll go out to West Texas. Mm, Shalom O'Korea. Yes, Andrews. Where am I going to be preaching? How about a laundromat? I can't dream this up. And I certainly couldn't dream Oop up. <laughs> but Oop was used by God. Yeah. Oop was my ram in the thicket. Yeah. Oop was my ravens down at the brook. Yeah. Oop was my widow woman in Zarephath. And Oop was my fish in the sea. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that was nine debt-free airplanes ago. Hallelujah. Yeah. But it all started with Oop. About a year later, I'm out in New Mexico, Hobbs, New Mexico. I, I installed a young man who trained under my ministry as, as pastor in this church. They'd asked me to send him a pastor. So I go out there to install him as pastor. And I get through and I'm just talking with people, you know, and I felt this hand on my shoulder. I said, Brother Jerry. I thought, that's hoop. <laughs> I, I hadn't turned around yet. I thought, they, 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 nobody sound quite like that. That's hoop. I turned around and I said, Oop, is that you? I turned around to this man. It was Oop's eyes. It was Oop's face. This man weighed about 175 pounds. I said, Oop, is that you? He said, it is, Brother Jerry. And you know I wouldn't be here unless God told me. God told me to come see you. I got something for you. I said, Oop, what happened to you? He said, God took away my Twinkies. <laughs> He said, I don't need no Twinkies unless God tells me. <laughs> Amen. Well, the last time I saw Oop, he was back up about 250. He got his Twinkies back, I think. <laughs> but Oop don't do nothing unless God tells him. He called me one time. He said, Brother Jerry, it's Oop. He said, you know, I wouldn't call you unless God told I said, I know Oop. <laughs> this is just a few years ago. I said, what, what, what do you need, Oop? He said, you got a partner out here in Andrews. She's in that meeting in the laundromat. You remember that, don't you? I thought, oh, I'll never forget that. <laughs> he said, there's a lady that became your partner in that meeting, and she's out here in Andrews dying of cancer. And God told me, and you know I wouldn't tell you this unless God told me, if you'll come lay your hands on her, God will heal her. Are you coming? I said, well, Oop, I'm going to be in John Hagee's church in the morning. And as soon as I get out of that service, I'll fly to Andrews and you pick me up at the airport and take me to her house. He said, I'll be there. I said, no, Oop, don't tell anybody I'm coming. Just, I'm just going to go to her house and pray for her. Just like the Lord told you. Okay. So he picked me up at the airport. I took my son-in-law Rodney and my youngest daughter Terry with me. And... Uh, Terry had heard about Oop all of her life, but had never met him. And so uh, Terry, my daughter, was trying to conceive a child and couldn't. And medical science could not figure out why she couldn't conceive. And she's believing God for a baby and just couldn't conceive. And so they pick us up and take us way out in the boondocks. And we got out there and there's cars everywhere. I said, Oop. I told you not to tell anybody I was coming. I didn't tell nobody, Brother Jerry. I said, what are all these cars? He said, I don't know. We went in the house. Well, she told all her relatives. 
And they all came. Man, we having a revival in this little house. <laughs> Laid my hands on her and prayed for her. God healed her, praise God. Oop takes us back to the airport and he's sitting in the right side of this pickup truck. His wife was driving and I'm sitting uh, behind Oop and my daughter Terry and Rodney, my son-in-law, are sitting here. And we're driving along there and Oop turns around to Terry and says, now, I think your daddy's probably told you I don't tell anything or say anything unless God tells me. She said, yes, sir, Mr. Hoop. That's what my daddy told me. She said, well, little, he's called her little daughter. She said, little darling, I just want you to know God told me to tell you this time next year, you're going to have a baby and she's going to look just like you. <laughs> well, if you saw my granddaughter today, you would think it's like having Terry all over again. But that was Hoop. Hearing from the Lord, hallelujah. Amen. Folks, I'm here to tell you tonight that we're headed for supernatural provision and breakthroughs like we've never experienced before. There's a ram in the thicket waiting on you. There are ravens at the brook waiting on you. There's a widow woman in Zarephath waiting on you. There is a fish in the sea waiting on you. And there's a oop somewhere. I said, there's a oop somewhere, praise God. Amen. Do you believe him tonight? How many of you, how many of you will dare stretch your faith and believe for supernatural provision beyond anything you've ever experienced before? Lift both hands and thank God in advance right now. Would you do that? Lift both hands and thank God in advance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I read a commentary not too long ago that said Jehovah Jireh is literally interpreted the Lord sees and he takes, takes special care to provide everything that is necessary for the comfort and the support of them who would trust him. He went on to say his eye ever affects his heart and his hand is ever ready to supply. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me close it with this. In each one of these cases, with Abraham, with Elijah, with Peter, did you notice before the supernatural provision manifested, God asked each one of them to do something, then the natural was not sensible, nor rational, you might say. Offer your son. Go to a brook and ravens will feed you. When the brook dries up, go to Zarephath and a widow woman will sustain you. And if you read that story, when he got there, that widow woman actually told him, all I have is enough for me and my son. We're going to eat it and die. Don't you think he thought God missed this one? He said he commanded that woman to sustain me. And she's got enough for her and her son. They're going to eat and die. But notice, in obedience to God, he went to the brook. In obedience to God, he went to Zarephath. In obedience to Jesus, Peter went to the sea. Even though in all the years he'd been a fisherman, he'd never caught a fish with money in his mouth. Notice, supernatural provision seems to be the product or the Result of obedience. Amen? Amen? Obedience. What's God asking you to do? Brother Copeland taught me this years ago. He said, if you seem like your faith has hit a wall and you're not getting the kind of results that you know you should be getting, go back and make sure you obeyed the last thing God told you to do. Go back and Make sure you have obeyed the last thing God told you to do. Amen. Obedience opens the door to the supernatural. Hallelujah. I don't know what God has told you to do. I don't know what he might speak to you to do tonight regarding the seed you're going to sow in this offering. Supernatural provision is his plan for you. That's what he desires to do. Each time I've experienced it, and I could tell you story after story after story if I had enough time tonight. 
But each time I've done it, it's always required obedience in doing something that in the natural was not reasonable to the natural mind. I know they know that. I mean, they've, they've experienced this just like we have. Amen. I was in 1981 preaching Brother Copeland in Charlotte, North Carolina at his East Coast Believers Convention along with Charles Capps and Norval Hayes, Brother Copeland, Gloria. And on Thursday afternoon when I went to my room after I'd preached, Carolyn said she was going to go in the bedroom and take a nap because Brother Copeland was preaching that night. And she said, if I don't get a nap, I'm not going to be able to stay awake tonight while he's preaching. She said, are you going to lay down and rest a while? I said, no, I'm just going to sit here in the living room in this suite we're in in the hotel. And I said, I'm just going to sit here and relax, but I don't really want to go to sleep. So she went into the bedroom and shut the door. I took my suit off and just put my robe on and I sat on the sofa and I propped my feet up on the coffee table. And the moment I did, the Shekinah glory filled that room. And I experienced a supernatural visitation from the Lord. And he said to me, my people are in financial famine. And I'm going to reveal to you the keys that will bring them out and hold you responsible for sharing them everywhere you go. And so, I mean, it was, it was amazing. It, it, it seemed like I, I took a, a yellow legal pad that was on the end table by the sofa and I filled it with what Jesus said to me. It seemed like he was there for hours. It was moments, which let me know Jesus can say more in moments than most preachers can in a lifetime. But I had a notebook full of what he said. And, and he left, but the place was filled with the Shekinah glory of God. It was so thick, I couldn't even see the furniture. And Carolyn walked in. She said, what's going on in here? And she got caught up in it. And she just sat down right where she was and we just bask in it until it lifted. And she said, what did he say? And so I told her. She said, what are you going to do with this? I said, I'm not, I'm not. She said, you going to tell Brother Cole? I said, no, I'm not telling him a thing about this. I'm just going to let the Lord tell him. So we went over to the meeting that night. It was the last night. No, it's Thursday night. And Brother Copeland was supposed to speak. And he got up and tried to. How I many opened his Bible and said, let's open our Bibles and then couldn't tell us where. He did that three times and we still don't know where he wants us to open our Bibles. Finally, he shut his and he said, Jerry, I'm sitting on the front row next to Gloria, my wife, Charles and Peggy Capps and Norval Hayes. Jerry, God visited you today. Come up here and tell us what he said. So I walked up there and <laughs> Brother Goldman had his... Uh, assistant bring him a chair and set it about this close to the pulpit. And when I walked by, he grabbed my coattail and he said, you tell us everything Jesus told you and don't you leave out one word. You understand me, boy? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so I, I preached that night on what he had told me. And I was in, I was in major need of some supernatural provision and breakthroughs when the Lord gave me the message. And before I went over there, not knowing that Brother Copeland was going to do this, I said, Lord, my ministry is experiencing a famine. He said, I not only gave this for you, but I gave it for the body of Christ wherever I send you. And he impressed upon me, and I, I'm, I'm not telling you, trying to get you to do this. This is not my purpose, so don't, don't don't do anything because you think that's my motivation here. I'm just telling you, obedience opens the door to the supernatural. And so the Lord impressed upon me to write $1,000 out of every department or outreach in my ministry, which I had 10 major outreaches with television, missions, and all, all the other things. And then he said, and Carol and I were believing to build our dream home at that time. And he said, and take $1,000 out of your personal account. And he said, and you sow all of those checks individually into Brother Copeland's ministry. Well, I didn't know he was going to have me do it publicly. I, I, I thought he'd be behind the stage after the service. But after I finished preaching that, he said, do it now. Now, this is October of 1981. 
So I said, and Brother Copeland, would you stand right here, please? I said, I am, I am acting on what I just taught and I'm believing God for supernatural provision and breakthroughs. And I believe that my ministry will never experience a financial famine again. I said, here's $1,000 out of my television ministry, 1,000 out of mission, 1,000 out of aviation. Somebody said, well, if you sold $1,000 out of 10 departments, that's $10,000. That don't sound like famine to me. It does when you need millions. <laughs> I mean, $10,000 did not. It wouldn't even scratch the surface what I needed. In fact, $1,000 out of some of those departments, departments drained it dry. <laughs> yeah. And I, I sowed in it, each one of those departments and then my personal account. And the Lord said to me, now because of your obedience, I'm going to give you the blessing of Isaac. So I flipped over there to see what the blessing of Isaac was. He sowed in famine and reaped a hundredfold in the same year. Yes, same year. Yes, I said, Lord, it's October. He said, so. <laughs> Don't you remember I said one time, this time tomorrow. What's two months? Exactly. This time tomorrow. <laughs> Where's Diane? Diane, you were in that meeting. You remember it. And uh, so... Uh, I turned and did that, and the Lord said, I'm going to give you the blessing of Isaac. And the blessing of Isaac was a hundredfold in the same year. Thank you, Lord. And I did what the Lord told me, and I left there, and one week later, I was given my very first $100,000 check into my ministry. The next night, I was given an airplane that was worth over a quarter of a million. The next week, I was given another $100,000 from a missions outreach. Before December the 31st, 1981, I had received a hundredfold on every one of those $1,000 checks. And they all came supernaturally. I couldn't have dreamed them up in a thousand years. But every one of them represented a ram in the thicket. <laughs> Amen. A ram in the thicket. Yeah. You know, Diane, I'm going to tell this because you and Bill were that person. Yeah. Hallelujah. And you and Bill sold the first $100,000 check into my ministry I'd ever received. And you know what that did? It broke a barrier. $100,000 checks were not the rare anymore after that. They became the norm. And you and Bill started it. And I thank you. And I'll always be grateful. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't usually tell that publicly, but I want to do it in honor of you. Praise God. In honor of Bill. Hallelujah. What am I saying? Supernatural provision and breakthroughs beyond what we've ever experienced before. This is not anything new to God. We already saw in the Bible, He's been doing it ever since Genesis 22. Right. Amen. Ever since Genesis 22, when Abraham stood up and declared, my God will provide. And God's been doing it ever since. Amen. God's been doing it ever since, but we're about to see Him take it to another level. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout if you receive it tonight. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good shout if you receive it. If you need supernatural provision and breakthroughs, would you please stand to your feet? And let's believe God right now. Let's set this in motion right now in the name of Jesus. I kind of figured it'd be just about everybody. And you think that's too big for God? I like what Brother Copeland says. If God came through here and blessed every one of us financially beyond our wildest dreams, it wouldn't even make a dent in his capital reserve. <laughs> Amen? Praise God. Join hands with the person next to you. Now, I'm believing. I'm not, I'm not just, 
I'm not just playing church. I'm believing for supernatural provision and breakthroughs for you. And, and many of the places I've gone and preached this message, I've gotten testimonies from pastors of things that have broken th loose and financial breakthroughs that have happened within 24 hours. I'm not promising everybody that, but I'm telling you, it's happening and it can happen to you. So you just mix your faith with it right now and don't back off. Amen. Now lift that hand that you've got lifted there and you just receive when I pray. And the moment I say amen, you shout at the top of your voice, I receive it. Will you do that? And all of you that are in the other church in Florida, you do it right along with all of us here. Father, in the name of Jesus, as the priest and the prophet of this service, at this moment, under your command and under your authority, you told me to stand up and stretch my hand over your people and decree supernatural provision and breakthroughs beyond anything they've ever seen before. And so I do so now in Jesus' name. I stretch my hands out over them and I decree supernatural provision and breakthroughs beyond what they've ever experienced before in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Say it again. I receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.